Good evening, and uh, first of all, I want to thank you all, audience, for participating in today's uh, webinar. And uh, you all know that this is a very, very important webinar to, to see what's going on with the current uh, uh, treatment with uh, COVID-19. You all know the RP took initiation in the beginning of, uh, of disease, and uh, we did several things like you know plasma registration, register and, uh, and educate the, the the governors and also senators and congressmen about the conversion plasma and uh, did several webinars and distribute the mass through the RP. Currently, we are doing the, the COVID fund distributing all over the country to for uh, needy people in the in the because of the COVID. And uh, this is Dr. Sudhakar General Lagada, President Alec, and uh, we have a very very exciting speakers today. And you all know that till today, about 4 million people are uh, infected with this virus, and about 1.5 million has been recovered, luckily, and about 270,000 diseases. So a lot to learn is the day to day uh, issues going on. And uh, we thank you all the speakers, first of all. And first of all, I want to thank Dr. Kalapata Gundapaligaru for took the real initiation. And uh, I would like to introduce the moderator first. First, Dr. Prasad is a practicing uh, pulmonary critical care sleep doctor in a Gwinnett plant area. And uh, he is a frontline doctor taking care of the COVID patients. And Dr. Sunil Kaza is an interventional cardiologist from Nashville. And uh, he's also incoming uh, uh, regional director for National Appeal. And Dr. Sujit Kondam, also an uh, interventional cardiologist, also incoming regional director uh, next year. And he's practicing from uh, uh, California. Without further ado, I'll, I'll give it to Dr. Prasad Garimala to start giving the disclosure. Thank you. Good evening, all. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the RP's webinar on uh, RP's uh, COVID-19 pulmonary critical care webinar. So before we start, I want to uh, read out the disclaimer. So the services of AP RP uh, COVID-19 teleconferences is for information purposes only. It should not be considered as medical or financial advice. RP has no liability as to how this is interpreted. RP has no liability for results, losses, damages that may be caused directly or indirectly or incidentally. Please refer to CDC website and or your state government health authority for information and updates. And uh, thank you to Api. Uh, Api is uh, very dedicated to helping you all to attain the knowledge and skills to fight out this uh, pandemic that changed our lives. So um, we have five distinguished speakers tonight. And uh, first, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Kalpalata Guntupalli. Dr. Guntupalli is a Francis Friedman and Oscar Friedman Endowed Professor of Pulmonary Disorders. He is currently the Chief of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine, Pentop General Hospital. She is also the Program Director of Critical Care Fellowship at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. She was past president of RP from 1999 to 2000, and she was past president of American College of Chest Physicians in 2010. It is indeed a privilege and an honor to introduce our speaker, distinguished Dr. Kalpalata Guntupalligari. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Garimela. Um, my task today is to just give you a general outline of COVID-19 and the challenges in our specialty. I guess we all have to get used to the new normal where the children think that a mask is a part of their body and get upset when we actually take the mask out. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I submit that this is a first in our lifetimes. When did we see an infectious disease that affected someone you know and is seriously ill from it and some of them may actually die from it? 
when did we see a good percentage, 8 to 14% of our colleagues infected from patients? When did we see the lockdown for the whole world? And we are the new soldiers with boots on the ground, ground in the trenches with serious risk to ourselves and perhaps even our families. When did we see the hospitals filled with patients with one disease? When did we in the recent past see so many patients younger than 15 critically ill from one disease? When did we see specialists take care of the ICU patients? When was there a healthcare crisis in the nation and no one could volunteer because we were needed locally as well? And when did we think that the construction workers and oil industry engineers can help us take care of patients? And when did sports arenas become hospitals? And when did the whole world stay home, but they were not on vacation and indeed were afraid to socialize? How does one prepare and how did anyone prepare? I mean, there are nation, national professional associations that give us some guidelines. There are regional wide preparations. For example, in Texas, we have Southeast Texas Regional Advisory Council that coordinates a lot of hospitals in various counties. And in the medical center, you have various other preparations and basically coordination with emergency room wards and ICU to have a seamless care of these patients. Uh, one thing I would like to share uh, that in Houston community, we prepared uh, back in the January to February when we start see, started seeing the cases in China and New York and Seattle, we formed in a WhatsApp group with uh, 207 intensivists and we have uh, conference calls, webinars uh, with speakers, uh, who have seen a number of cases before we actually started seeing. I have no doubt in my mind that this also functioned as a support group and contributed to perhaps less burnout because some of the practitioners, smaller community hospitals did not feel alone and they could really write to the rest of the group even at 2 a.m. Um, in a critical care area, you need to have an expansion plan. I'm sure all of you have, and this is our plan. It could be from whatever your capacity, let's say you have a capacity of 16 and how much can you search, how high can you go and how high can you actually staff because you don't want to be actually uh, caught by surprise and really um, not be able to take care of patients. Again, a treatment algorithm is developed um, and this is a treatment algorithm for general uh, guidelines for different hospitals in our uh, medical school, where you have some objective criteria, how are you going to approach a patient with PUI, and then uh, with some objective criteria for mild disease, moderate disease, and severe disease. I don't mean for you to read this, but it will be on the uh, slide deck, so you can take a look later on. And then you actually modify as we get more data. And in fact, this is one disease where we have been modifying quite often. Um, at this stage, perhaps we are also talking about uh, triage. How do you actually triage these patients? This was a paper, paper that just came out very, very recently that talks about who will live and who will die and how do you actually prioritize admitting these patients. And it's a very nicely written uh, paper with priority one, two, three, and four, which really make a lot of sense. And some sort of a triage criteria you need to have that suits your hospital and your medical center. One of the challenges we have in critical care is how do we prepare for some of these um, commonly occurring instances such as a patient who has a cardiac, cardiopulmonary arrest, which may be a little bit different in these patients because they're so infectious. Normally when there's a, a code blue, you know, so the door is wide open and so many people are inside and outside the room. Here to avoid infectivity, you need to have a plan who will stay in the room, who will stay outside the room, and normally defibrillator sits on top of the cord cord, but here we separate so that we don't have to throw out all the medications if the cord cord goes inside because the medication supply chain may be a big problem in these patients. So you need to specifically have plans for triage as well as code blue. And this is something we have known for a while, which is mechanical compression devices, but this has been recommended um, to consider by American Heart and where you have the main challenge in a cardiac arrest situation is who will compress uh, and you have to um, actually rotate them every two minutes. So in fact, a number of uh, hospitals in our area have acquired these mechanical compression devices and nurses really are very happy because they don't have to be uh, doing this. Again, the innovations can really save you and your colleagues. This was a publication from New England Journal that talks about 
anesthesiology is getting sprayed when the patient coughs. Although he's not actually intubating, he's just standing at the head of the bed. So this innovation by a Taiwanese anesthesiologist where you put your hands through these rubber um, entries here and the patient head is here uh, re to reduce the splash. And actually some of the oil company engineers in Houston have uh, made these and donated to us. So uh, some of the other things that we can do uh, is to put the pumps outside the patient room so the nurse doesn't have to go inside every time you have to make a small adjustment in doses and so on. This is a, uh, one of the therapists, the, the device state when he extubates so the patient doesn't cough uh, on the people around. So this is how they're extubating. So these are some of the innovations that are made locally. And if you don't have yeah. enough negative pressure rooms, which is a problem in every hospital, you can put HEPA filters attached to the room and you can even have ventilator monitors and patient monitors uh, somewhat facing the window or even outside. It takes a lot of uh, toll, both physical and mental. Uh, this is uh, from uh, China and similar uh, PPEs were used in Italy, which we are not using here. But these can be very, this can get very hot. You can't eat and they did six hour shifts. However, even here you are um, under these N95 mask and face shield and all of these. And you can have these ulcers. I'm sure many of you have experienced. The mental toll it can take, this was um, a ER director in Manhattan who committed suicide. This was a lady who lost the custody of her daughter because she was working in the emergency room. And a nurse was reported to be shot because she was wearing scrubs um, on the street. So this takes both a physical and a mental toll on the healthcare workers. This is a publication from China that talks about having uh, almost half of the patients to have depression, symptoms of anxiety. And as you know, that of all the specialists, the critical care physicians have the highest level of burnout uh, in our profession. So this is not, uh, this is adding and this is really helping cope with the stress. Um, even getting infected, initially in China, 3,300 Healthcare workers were infected before they knew about the extent of the infectivity. Then they had to fly 45,000 from outside the Wuhan province. As of April 15th, about 9,000 healthcare workers were sick with COVID in USA. And more than, it says more than 200 doctors and nurses have died. I think it is a gross underestimation because it says uh, in USA too, and we ourselves know many more than that. I would say ten, top 10 administrative takeaway points. This is not a sprint. In sprint, in sprint, we give all we got at one time. This is a marathon, so we have to pace ourselves. Your poor planning can cost lives. Protect your healthcare workers should be your top most priority. Going from resource rich to resource poor may only be a week away, and we learned that hard way in New York. Command and control central should be the coordinating effects body. Plan, rehearse, and prepare to change again in 24 hours. This is the story of this epidemic. Keep changing it. Prepare to train personnel not normally trained for those tasks. ARDS has relatively longer ICU course, so patients accumulate and you reach your capacity very quickly. When you build, you build 20% workforce for outages from COVID illness, exhaustion, and so on. Keep up the morale. Be cognizant of the burnout, anxiety, and depression. Always remember that people around you take cues from your body language, behavior, coping skills, et cetera. This is a picture from polio war from 1950s in LA County. Here it says, without basic research, the best treatment for polio today would have been a high-tech iron lung. So if Sark and Sabin didn't make the vaccine, today we would be touting uh, with uh, iron lungs with a lot of bells and whistles. So basic science research is important. We also need to prepare for probably a secondary surge or be prepared that this will be with us for 18 months to two years and be prepared to have to run this marathon. So I want to submit to you that we want to interfere and intervene before it's too late. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Jim Superbe. That was very, very informative. Um, we will come back to the next uh, questions after we finish up with the speakers talking about um, the rest of the four topics. I request uh, Dr. Kaja to introduce the next two speakers there. Thank you. Thank you, Prasad. Um, it's an honor to uh, present the next uh, presenter. First of all, I want to thank all the speakers and also audience for taking time out of your busy lives to attend this. And also I want to thank all the critical care doctors on this panel and also the other frontline workers who have been working hard uh, 
uh, putting their life at risk. And the next uh, speaker is Dr. Seema Tekwani. She went to medical school in Mumbai, uh, Topiwala Medical National Medical School. Uh, and then she's currently working as an assistant professor in critical care at Emory University, Atlanta. She's going to speak and uh, enlighten us about non-invasive ventilation and uh, high flow oxygen, critically ill COVID patients before they are ventilated. And then the next speaker will be talking about the ventilator management and other things. Thank you, Dr. Tekwan. Thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you, Api, for um, uh, giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, can everybody see the screen? Yes. Yeah. You can probably do the full screen, so. Okay, all right. Yeah. All right. Yes. Uh, thank you for introducing me. Um, I wanted to focus on the non-invasive uh, ventilator, uh, non-invasive management of respiratory failure in COVID-19. I want to start by looking at these, uh, this slide. It kind of highlights the varied severity of illness which all of these patients present with. I think they are in three big groups. The hyperacute presentation, which is the patients who are immediately coming into the hospital and in the ER and need immediate intubation. A lot of these patients, from my experience, are ones who have of comorbid illnesses and have other reasons also in addition to hypoxemia from COVID-19 that need intubation. So for example, someone who comes in with COPD exacerbation and COVID-19 on top. Uh, the second group, which is the indolent group, is I think the biggest group where uh, they come in with uh, mild symptoms and they are gradually progressing with, to moderate and severe hypoxemia with only moderate work of breathing. A lot of these patients do improve, but the biggest worry is the third group where these indolent uh, group patients worsen and go into the biphasic phase where they have an acute deterioration with hyperinflammation and uh, worsening bilateral infiltrates, consolidation and need for oxygen therapy. Um, within, uh, and that's the group which we really want to step in and intervene before the biphasic uh, phase sets in by using non-invasive ventilation strategies. Um, at Emory, we've sort of uh, split them into five phases of uh, respiratory failure in these patients. The first phase is the prodrome where they have minimal symptoms and a lot of them are not even in the hospital at this time. Um, this phase two is where they start having subjective shortness of breath and have oxygen needs and they are admitted to the hospital. Uh, phase three and four is really where I think uh, an ICU physician or an ICU team should intervene and think about how do we approach hypoxic respiratory failure in these patients. Uh, phase three, where they have an increasing oxygen need going up to 10 to 50 liters, 15 liters on oral cannula, worsening anxiety and shortness of breath with more coughing and secretions can come up. Uh, and phase four is really more progression where they need more than conventional nasal cannula therapy and would need supportive therapy with either high flow nasal cannula or worse, proceed to intubation. Um, phase five is the one which we usually see in the ICU and I'll leave it for the next speaker to comment on. Uh, high flow nasal cannula as a strategy is uh, really came to the forefront uh, from the Florali study in 2015, where it studied uh, approach to respiratory failure with oxygen compared uh, with the nasal cannula versus high flow nasal cannula versus uh, non-invasive ventilation. Uh, there was a really st strong signal for improvement in patients who are using high flow nasal cannula in ARDS um, with pneumonia. Um, initially, as um, uh, we all know, there was significant concerns about aerosol generation with high flow nasal cannula from experience from other continents and in Italy. Um, but uh, thinking about it a little bit more and looking at the studies that have been published, the risk is not that high, especially when you combine it with good infection control practices, including using airborne precautions for your healthcare workers, and also giving a mask to the patient so that will prevent transmission to the team taking care of it. And um, it's important to note that um, coughing by itself can generate about 400 liters per minute in terms of aerosol. So really a mask for the patient helps in that scenario. Um, uh, Multiple societies have come out and have given recommendations on high flow nasal cannula. The ANZICS group from Australia and New Zealand recommended high flow uh, therapy uh, for patients as long as we're wearing appropriate PPE for our protection. Negative pressure rooms are obviously favored and preferable, but we all recognize that the resources are limited and being innovative and creative with uh, using HEPA filters could be helpful. The surviving sepsis guidelines also suggested use of high flow nasal cannula 
The WHO guidelines comments on using high flow and both non-invasive, but really not more studies have come out on non-invasive ventilation just yet. Um, for CPAP and BiPAP in COVID-19, I think it's important to recognize that uh, non-invasive ventilation with CPAP and BiPAP both offers us an opportunity to open up collapsed alveoli and therefore can help by improving VQ, VQ matching and decrease our work of, decrease the work of breathing for the patient. Uh, CPAP by itself uh, can increase the mean airway pressure and can help improve oxygenation. Uh, BiPAP can sometimes increase tidal volumes which can contribute to ventilator-induced lung injury. Uh, so we might want to be careful about how we use BiPAP in these patients, but there may be a role for COPD positive, COPD exacerbation patients who have COVID-19 in consideration instead of moving to early intubation in these patients. Uh, again, not a lot of good literature just yet on BiPAP, but I know hospitals across the country are exploring how to use it correctly with safety precautions for the team members. Um, we at our hospital are recommending a good fitting mask uh, ensuring strict infection control. And we are actually using portable negative pressure room, uh, negative pressure machines uh, in, uh, in these environments. In addition to adding an inhalation HEPA filter and an exhalation HEPA filter to the BiPAP uh, mask. Um, target a minute ventilation of six to seven liters per minute, not too much, again, to prevent uh, ventilator induced lung injury from high tidal volume. Um, Prone positioning um, is, the, is the next strategy, which I think has a huge role in these patients. Um, there is obviously benefit of prone positioning when you uh, turn patients from supine to prone. You allow recruitment of previously collapsed posterior lung region and improving VQ mis, uh, mismatch. Um, multiple studies have shown improvement in oxygenation with prone positioning, but the Guren study in 2013 in NHM really showed a mortality benefit in intubated patients. Uh, the role in non-intubated patients is controversial, but there have been some small studies which have again demonstrated improvement in hypoxia and of course improved secretion clearance when you're on your belly uh, uh, for uh, uh, coughing and uh, having any secretion that can come out. Um, decreased intubation rates have also been described in combination with BiPAP hypronasal cannula in another Chinese study, which came in March and was done before the COVID pandemic. Um, this is a quick picture of um, supine and uh, prone positioning and how CT scan images look in these patients. Uh, A and B are uh, patients who are supine and C and D are patients who are prone. And as you can see, the posterior areas of the lung really open up with uh, prone positioning. Um, so uh, there have been a few small studies. Uh, one uh, was from Jingsu province in China, which described a multi-pronged approach with awake proning combined with high flow nasal cannula actually showed a lower intubation rate and uh, uh, also a lower mortality when combined with other regional resources that could, they could combine for their patients. Um, uh, uh, recently gave this case series of, about, uh, of patients where they did a prospective um, um, observation trial, and they were able to avoid intubation in as many as 65% of the patients. Um, I think this is a strategy which we have really aggressively pushed in our hospital. We are still trying to figure out which phenotype is most likely to benefit from prone positioning, but in the meanwhile, we're proning everyone because it's such a low risk procedure, minimally resource intensive, and uh, the Intensive Care Society of UK has published a, a really nice protocol, which is worth looking at for anyone who wants to build one for their own hospital. Uh, we looked at it, and uh, based on that, we have one on Emory's internet webpage and the links below. Um, good candidates would be anyone who has pure hypoxic respiratory failure and can tolerate high flow nasal cannula. Patients who are able to communicate distress or able to call for help. Patients who can independently reposition. Again, very, very limited resources are needed then. And again, you can use it as a great strategy when you're trying to open up more ICU beds for, a, for a sort of waiting for intubation when they get to an ICU bed. Uh, poor candidates would be people who are actively bleeding or have a difficult airway or an unstable spine. There's multiple other uh, uh, contraindications or relative contraindications your hospital can consider if you wish to pursue this as a treatment strategy. And um, I, this is my last slide and I want to leave it up there that I think non-invasive ventilation combined uh, with, uh, with or without prone positioning really works very well when you choose the right patients and it has minimal risk and uh, uh, resources that are utilized. 
Um, protocolized approach will obviously help avoid any uh, patient safety events. Um, this obviously has to be balanced with intubation and uh, what, uh, the need for controlled intubation in these patients. I think the resource utilization for patients who land up in the ICU intubated is immense and they have a prolonged ICU course from ARDS and we've seen a lot of super infections and mortality that can come with ICU stays. So I think if we can use these non-invasive strategies and uh, we can probably avoid some of those adverse complications in our patients. With that, I would like to end my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tekwani. That was a very concise and uh, detailed uh, presentation. And uh, that is a great presentation to avoid uh, intubation as much as possible. Um, once uh, people go from this stage to the next stage, so uh, they'll be ventilated and, and um, they are more sicker. And Dr. Samir Kanijo is going to enlighten us about ventilator management, ECMO usage, and lung protective ventilation, and also proning. In the past, we were not used to uh, hearing about ECMO that much, except the critical care doctors and cardiologists, cardiothoracic surgeons. But now with this COVID, um, everybody is hearing about this uh, uh, ECMO and everything else. It would be nice to hear about that. And Dr. Kanijo is, uh, uh, has graduated his medical school from New York Medical College. Currently, he's an assistant professor of medicine in critical care and sleep medicine at Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hostra Northwell, New York. And uh, without further ado, Dr. Kanijo. Thank you. So hi again, uh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for letting me speak. Uh, I'm Samir Kanijo, a pulmonary critical care doctor at Northwell Health here in uh, Long Island, New York. Um, we've been dealing with COVID-19 now since early March, uh, and I'm just gonna talk about some of the critical care strategies once you've gotten to the point of uh, unfortunate intubation in these patients with COVID ARDS. So as you may have heard, uh, or as you've heard, you know we have the options for higher uh, amounts of oxygen, higher flows, non-invasive support um, for our patients. However, many will still ultimately require invasive mechanical ventilation. First, at the decision to intubate, the most experienced practitioner um, should be the one doing the intubation with the appropriate PPE uh, and preferably with video laryngoscopy, again, to decrease the risk of transmission as you saw earlier. Um, once intubated, the goal is really for lung protective ventilation um, to minimize ventilator-induced lung injury. This means low tidal volume ventilation starting with high FiO2s and titrating down, providing appropriate PEEP um, to allow oxygenation and targeting plateau pressures less than 30. We really then follow blood gases to adjust the ventilators as necessary. If our PDF ratios are less than 200, that indicates moderate to severe ARDS, and we consider adjunctive therapies at that point, such as paralytics, advanced ventilator settings or modes, prone positioning uh, now in intubated patients, or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, which is ECMO. ARDS is acute respiratory distress syndrome. This was first identified in 1967, uh, and the definition most recently updated by the Berlin criteria in 2013. This really provided a standardization of definition, which helped with identification, research, and ultimately evaluation of different treatment options. What the Berlin criteria did is they defined ARDS as an acute diffuse inflammatory lung injury leading to increased vascular permeability, increased lung weight, and loss of aerated lung tissue with hypoxemia and bilateral radiographic opacities. Associated with increased venous sac mixture, increased physiologic dead space, and decreasing lung compliance. Simply put, what it requires is an acute onset, usually less than one week, bilateral opacities on lung imaging, a P to F ratio of less than 300 with at least a PEEP of five and something not attributable to cardiac disease or volume overload. The severity is graded based on a PF criteria, PF ratio as you see, and a PF ratio less than 100 is what's considered severe ARDS and showed a 45% mortality um, when applied to prior cohorts. What the Berlin criteria also did is it abandoned the term acute lung injury, uh, which we used to use for a lot of different pulmonary processes. 
Ventilator management is really uh, key in ARDS and is centered around lung protective ventilation to limit ventilator induced lung injury. Low tidal volume ventilation has been studied extensively and does improve outcomes when we actually adhere to it. The ARDSNET guidelines pictured here have put forth an algorithm to help ensure appropriate ventilation. They provide PEEP and FiO2 tables uh, and methods to target plateau pressures. Really, they make this as simple as possible for us. With this management, patients either get better and we can wean them, or they don't improve and we move on to adjunctive therapies, which I'll touch on in a little bit. A few important ventilator parameters that we look at are PEEP, peak pressures, plateau pressures, and driving pressures, which can help us understand um, the pressure that we're transmitting to the lungs and hopefully help us prevent that ventilator-induced lung injury, which is really part of the downfall uh, as our patients deteriorate. Just a word of caution as we talk about ventilator management, because you know, as, as you know, there's an alphabet soup of different ventilator modes, different ways that we can ventilate people. They all have some positive aspects, but one must really adhere to good patient-centered evidence-based clinical care and utilize the mode of ventilation that you understand the best, that you can make changes on when problems arise. And that's really what's gonna help us prevent progression of this disease. Again, our hope is with ARGENET guidelines, with ventilator management, that we use the ventilator in such a way that we don't have to move towards proning, that we don't have to move towards ECMO. However, what ARGENET does do is it creates a scenario where all ARDS is the same. It's a one size fits all method um, that may or may not be, be true. There are some, uh, as I'm sure many of you have read, such as Dr. Gattinoni from Germany, who's looked at many of the Italian patients and uh, a world leader in ARDS management, who has posited that COVID ARDS may actually be two different phenotypes, a type L and a type H. Type H here on the bottom is a high elastins or low compliance stiff lung. This is, uh, this is what typical ARDS is. This is highly recruitable and really does respond to high peak. However, they also believe there's another type, a type L, which is a low elastance or normal lung compliance. These patients, they believe, are not going to respond to high PEEP, not going to be recruitable. And they are those that have a predominant ground glass features on, on their imaging. They believe, and they've, they've suggested that this group would be better suited with higher tidal volumes and lower PEEP strategies, which actually sort of flies in the face of most of the ARDS research that's been out there. Where they worry is that if these patients with type L or normal compliance lungs are exposed to high pressures, if they're exposed to high transpulmonary pressures, uh, they will eventually progress to type H or typical ARDS. You know, this is being sort of hotly debated in the, in the literature as we speak now, and it seems that most or many others actually believe that type L just may be a mild form of ARDS, but again, as we move forward and, and we debate these things, this goes back to the importance of uh, appropriate evidence-based ventilator management and really trying to limit the pressure our patients' lungs are feeling. However, if despite good ventilator strategies, patients continue to have a PF ratio less than 150, then we start to consider adjunctive therapies. You know, the first is neuromuscular blockade to decrease metabolic demands to continue to ensure ventilator synchrony. The next is prone positioning, which you heard a lot about in the non-invasive setting, but really comes forth from those that are mechanically uh, ventilated. In the PROSEVA trial, which came out in 2013 and was featured in the New England Journal, they really demonstrated significantly higher survival in the prone groups. What prone positioning does is it markedly reduces overinflated lungs, it promotes alveolar recruitment, and it prevents ventilator-induced lung injury uh, by homogenizing the distribution of stress and strain in the lungs. That term, that ventilator-induced lung injury, is really what we're trying to prevent in these people. And then we come to ECMO, sort of this thing, as, as you heard, everyone is now starting to uh, see and hear and think about. You know, ECMO, um, again, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, um, is what we use as salvage therapy when patients don't respond. Um, here's a flow chart from ELSO, which is the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization, um, that they put out as to how you determine whether or not to apply someone for ECMO. But to take a step back, first we have to understand what ECMO is. ECMO is essentially um, taking blood out from the venous system, 
oxygenating it outside of the body and putting it back into the body, allowing the lungs to rest. Really, when we use ECMO, what we're doing is we're trying to give as little pressure to the lungs um, as possible. And so you can put patients on tidal volumes that are uh, very low. You can make respiratory rates very low. And, and again, just completely take away the work from the lungs. And this buys time. What also um, has suggested is they advocate for responsible use and not overuse of ECMO based on an individual system's capacity. Uh, and they believe that it should be offered to patients that are expected to have favorable outcomes. They don't think that the indications for ECMO uh, should change. It should maintain as people with refractory hypoxemia, which is the algorithm from the top, uh, or refractory hypercapnia despite appropriate lung protective um, ventilation and the use of other adjunctive therapies such as proning. So ECMO shouldn't come uh, before proning in the algorithm of, of how we treat these patients. However, there are contraindications to ECMO. Some are bleeding, some are chronic lung disease, uh, multi-organ failure other than renal failure, um, and people that have been mechanically ventilated for more than 14 days. Generally, these guidelines are enough because the, the push for ECMO is not that high. Uh, however, these days, some centers have had to be even a little bit more stringent with that. But then what? What if your patients survive? What if they do better? Um, they survive this initial respiratory failure, but continue to require mechanical ventilation. Then the question comes to tracheostomy. When, how, and where? Because of the very high mortality um, that's been associated with the, this disease, most societies have come out with recommendations against early tracheostomies. So nothing in the first one to two weeks. Um, and most actually suggest waiting till at least three weeks to make sure patients are stable. Patients should be on minimal ventilatory um, settings, uh, and, and should be otherwise stable with, with hopefully single organ failure. Procedures should be done uh, at bedside in negative pressure rooms if possible and under complete paralysis to limit the spread. You should limit the number of providers in the room and then use a cuff trach again, which is necessary when someone's on uh, a ventilator. The last thing I'm gonna touch on um, is what to do when uh, patients have been on isolation for a while. When can we clear them? When can we not? And what we have we been doing? Really, we take a lot of our guidance from the CDC, uh, which has come out with both a symptom or time-based strategy and a test-based strategy. On our hospitals, hospitalized patients, we've been following the test-based strategy, which requires two consecutive negative respiratory samples, preferably endotracheal for these patients, more than 24 hours apart. Um, if both samples are negative, patients can then be cleared from isolation. Thank you. And these will be some of the references for you and all the handouts. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kani, Joe. It, it was a very quick and uh, you know, uh, concise uh, presentation and uh, yeah, you have gone through a lot of uh, criteria and everything else. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And um, Dr. Sujit will take over uh, from here and introduce the next speaker. And questions will be at the end. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, we are nicely cruising along tonight. Um, very precise presentation so far. So we've dealt with, uh, you know, ventilation strategies and uh, moving along. Uh, the next speaker is going to touch upon concepts and controversies. What is the role of steroids, anticoagulation, TAG studies, REs to LV dysfunction, bedside ultrasonography research trial, treatment options, anti-IL-6 agents, rem remdesivir, et cetera. And to, to do the honors on this topic, we have Dr. Sergio Trevino. Uh, he is an assistant professor uh, in pulmonary division at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, he did uh, go to medical school at Monterey Tech in Mexico and did his uh, residency at uh, uh, Baylor College of Medicine Fellowship at Washington State, uh, sorry, Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, Dr. Sergio, please take over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Happy, for having me. Thank you for the, inv the invitation. I am truly honored. 
my screen should come up soon. Okay, so uh, again, uh, I'm truly honored and thank you. Um, some of the concepts, basically every slide that I'm gonna touch base could merit a, a whole hour of uh, presentation. But I'm gonna touch on the high points and then we can use the questions at the end to if we want to discuss more in details. So the first thing is the slide. I, it, it's, it's a slide that was created at the beginning of the, of the, of the, of the COVID, of the pandemic. And they, I think it shows very nicely how we have our stage one where there's viral replication. As it progresses, then we, uh, then we have our uh, stage two, which is a happy inflammatory space. This is where we deal with in the ICU, basically where the patients get sicker and they develop a lot of uh, uh, hyperinflammatory uh, reaction. And so moving along with, uh, with uh, our talks of the day, we can talk about steroids and COVID-19 and AR ARDS. Basically, is there a role to use steroids for treatment of these patients? And focusing specifically for severe lung injury and in the ICU, for ARDS, the answer is still up in the air. Uh, from the treatment guidelines from NIH and IDSA, they're against, uh, they recommend against the use of steroids, or basically only if it's in a randomized control setting, uh, uh, a randomized control trial. The Society of Critical Care Medicine and the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, on the other hand, they favor and suggest the use of uh, steroids for a specific population of COVID-19 patients with ARDS. But uh, for all of this, the evidence is low. And uh, we can see here a certain protocol that's been suggested by a group of uh, highly renowned uh, critical care experts uh, that uh, was uh, published in Critical Care Explorations where they favor using uh, steroids for this group of patients. The spectrum is very wide. There's uh, groups that do that, that disfavor steroids and there's groups that are advocating for it. We don't have any evidence that could truly support one way or the other. What we have is microbiology, pathophysiology, pharmacology, virology. And what this tells us uh, that is that at the beginning of the, of the, of the disease, when the vir during the viral replication phase, um, uh, the virus is, in, is driving the, the injury. And uh, we see this in um, transplant patients that are on steroids and uh, that are present in a very in a hyper reaction they, they present very ill and um, but then we have the other uh, end of the spectrum of patients that are only uh, that are having a hyper inflammatory reaction in which steroids could help uh, decrease the, the the inflammation and the fibrosis of the lungs and a lot of the pathophysiology of the diseases seems to be driven by hyperinflammation what we are doing right now is we're being patient selective. Patients that are past the initial phase, that are um, uh, developing signs in labs consistent with hyperinflammation and are worsening, then, then we start uh, using a protocol of steroids. But this is still uh, very debated. And this next slide, we talk about anticorrelation and the use of tags. Uh, anticorrelation, we, uh, I think it's widely accepted now in the, by everyone taking care of his patients that they are in a very evident pro-thrombotic state. On, the, on this side of the screen, we can see this is Mount Sinai's experience using anticorrelation. So the debate is, should we use anticorrelation or not? And they just published on the 1st of May, and this is a pre-publication, in which they, there's a, the improved survival in patients that are on anticoagulation, specifically on patients on mechanical ventilation. And so the Mount Sinai protocol was widely uh, distributed and basically uh, had patients on full dose anticoagulation, either Lovenox or um, Eliquis or heparin drips, if they were in the ICU or even if they were sick enough, even not in the ICU. 
and because in response to what they were seeing. Uh, at Baylor, we developed a tech-driven uh, protocol before we knew any of this data that's just published only a, a few days ago. And we, we, we would measure how hypercoagal a patient would be treated with heparin drip. And as long as they remain hypercoagulable, measured via tech, then we would continue on the heparin drip and adjust that based on the results of the tag and the inflammation and the patient stopped being hypercoagulable or presumed to be hypercoagulable when we saw in clinical improvement or when we see decrease in the, in the markers of uh, prothrombosis, then we start winning down on the anticoagulation. But this is still debated, but now it's uh, beginning to be accepted that the patients need anticoagulation. Uh, some group of patients, the question is what to use for anticoagulation, at what dose, for how long and when to start it. Then we move along to cardiac dysfunction. And ever since the start of this uh, pandemic, we knew that, um, that, that uh, patient, this is a viral infection that affects multiple organs. And so there was a, a, a component of viral myocarditis. Also, beyond viral myocarditis, there's a very inflammatory state and uh, stress. And so there's stress-induced cardiomyopathy. And so there's LV dysfunction. But we also, what we started noticing is that there's a, a very high degree of RV dysfunction. In this clip that we see here, we can see how this is the RV. It's a lot bigger than the LV. The LV is supposed to be bigger, but this is ballooned up. It should be a sliver like this. And it's all ballooned up. This type of RVs we see in massive PEs. And Granted, we are seeing in autopsy reports a lot of thromboembolism and a lot of incidents of pulmonary embolism, but we started noticing that patients were dying with this blown RV without any changes in their oxygenation. Once they were stabilized, they would die with this. And then, uh, so a couple of weeks ago, this was, this was uh, on your left side, uh, this uh, paper was published in which they were able to tell the mortality retrospectively based on RV dysfunction days ahead of time. So we know, we're learning as we go, that there is an RV dysfunction component that, uh, that uh, is uh, causing, uh, the, uh, that's uh, driving mortality. The question is what's driving that RV dysfunction? Is it the pulmonary hypertension? Is it the infection? Is it the virus? Is it thrombosis of all the pulmonary vasculature? Or is it a PE? Or is it all of the above? Moving along, uh, to bedside ultrasonography. Bedside ultrasonography, and specifically handheld ultrasonography, like the butterfly, uh, has been very useful as we limit the exposure of uh, Equitex to go into the room. So we are the intensivists. We can bring a handheld ultrasound machine and do some uh, tests. Here we can, in, the, in this uh, image, in this clip, we can see pulmonary hypertension. Again, you see this is the left ventricle, and it's the shape of a D. It's supposed to be round, and like a, in a circle, like a donut. But we can see this is uh, the pulmonary hypertension we were talking about, with the RV failure from this right ventricle that's huge. The images on the other side of the screen were actually images captured on a patient that's prone. So when we are trying to determine whether a patient needs to go on ECMO or not, one of the questions is, is it gonna be VV ECMO, basically to support the oxygen and the ventilation, or AV ECMO, which would also support the heart. So we had to learn as we go to do prone positioning ultrasound to see how the, the lung is uh, affected or how the heart is functioning to see if we need to go to AV ECMO or not. So now we move along to what I think everyone wants to hear about is what treatment options do we actually have for, for, uh, for uh, COVID right now? And so right up the top, Kaletra, lopinavir and ritonavir, an HIV medication that seems to have activity in vitro. Well, at the Lotus China trial, a trial that was done in China showed no benefits and it would require very high doses for it to make any uh, difference. So in short, we shouldn't be using Kaletra. Now to the controversy of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. So this study right here, this was a French study that included 26 patients versus 14 or 16 patients in which it showed uh, some improvement in the clearance of the virus. 
but uh, it was a very small study. It was retrospective. It wasn't controlled. And six of the 26 patients were excluded. And all six of those were excluded. Most were, they, were, they still had the virus. They, some of them were excluded because they went to the ICU or because they died. And so this uh, unleashed the fury of everyone wanting to use antimalarials. But then we now know that from multiple uh, uh, publications, including this most recent JAMA publication, Plaquenil and acitromycin for COVID-19 does not help. It does not improve mortality. And in fact, it increases the incidence of sudden cardiac arrest. So Calitra or chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, the answer is no, we don't use them. And uh, we're now, uh, there's some, randomized control trials, or there's some trials from anti-malarials, but those to be determined. So moving forward to what we want to know is remdesivir. Remdesivir is an antiviral that was developed initially for Ebola. And so there are many trials involving it, but we have the ACT-1 trial, which the preliminary results were given just a week or two ago. And basically, it improved the time to recovery from uh, 11 days versus 14 days, so modest improvement, but improvement. And it improved mortality from 8% to 11%. So not great, but it's better, definitely better than nothing. And it didn't make things worse, which is most important. And to note, uh, about a third of the patients in this trial were severely ill patients. So now that remdesivir has almost become the standard of care, except that we don't have it available yet. So now they're doing a second phase of the trial. It's called the ACT-2. Initially, they were going to do placebo versus remdesivir and placebo versus remdesivir immunomodulator. But because ACT-1 showed improvement, now they changed it and they're going to do remdesivir plus placebo versus remdesivir plus an immunomodulator. The theory is if you use an antiviral against the virus and an anti-inflammatory immunomodulator, what's it going to do? That's going to start soon. We don't have it available yet. The immunomodulators are in this an example is tocilizumab. This is an anti-IL-6 monoclonal antibody. IL-6 is severely elevated in what, and some of these patients have a cytokine storm. And so this is an, a, an antibody, a monoclonal antibody against IL-6. And so there were some positive preliminary results from China with very small numbers. Now we have a Covacta phase three. I think he lost. Uh, I think uh, he lost. Yeah, he lost it. Uh, okay. You want to go with the uh, yeah. speaker before going? Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll go ahead with the next speaker. Actually, yeah, go with the Dr. Tal uh, Talwar, please. Uh, um, um, Sujit, go ahead. Yes, yes. So we'll get back to Dr. Trevino once he gets back. Um, moving on. Uh, getting back to normalcy, challenges in our specialty, how to schedule bronchoscopies, PFTs, in-person visits, or electro, you know, e-visits. Uh, to speak on this topic, we have Dr. Arunab Palwar. He's a professor uh, at Donald oh, and Barbara Zucker sure. School of Medicine. You have to unload this, this screen. Oh, yeah. You have, you have to unload the screen, otherwise I cannot load my slide. Oh. Yeah, we will, we will work on that, I think. Um, 
Dr. Arunab Talwar is Hi. a professor at Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra, Northwell, New York. Uh, he did his uh, medical schooling in the yeah. Institute of Medical Sciences, residency at Jamaica Hospital and Winthrop University Hospital, fellowship at Winthrop University Hospital, Long Island Jewish. Uh, he's board certified in internal medicine, critical care medicine, pulmonary disease, and sleep medicine. Dr. Talwar, please take yeah. over. Uh, I Once think you have, have a screen on, yes. Um, you have to screen. Uh, can you take off the slide? But I can continue. It's not a big deal. Uh, thanks very much for the kind uh, introduction here. So while the screen pr problem is being sorted out, uh, I have a different view onto this. Uh, you know, we talk about the COVID infection as a three-stage phenomena, and that's what most critical care has focused on. But let me take a, a back seat and talk to you a little bit more from a pulmonologist's point of view, because I think it's a five-stage disease. Stage one is the stage. Stage one is just the viral infection. It was shown in the one of the previous slides. Stage two is when the viral infection goes away and there is an immune modulation or so-called cytokine storm. Cytokine storm usually occurs from seven to eleventh day after the illness has started. The third stage of the disease, which is the hyperinflammation stage, from pathophysiology point of view, we have mentioned that as causing more ARDS and end organ damage. But the story doesn't end there. The fourth stage of the disease is a thrombosis and vasculopathy. And fifth stage of the disease is further end organ damage. So as was nicely pointed out, the viral disease we see is in the initial first five days, seven days, most patients are at home during the cytokine storm is when the role of the critical care physician starts. And when there is end organ damage, which is a stage three, is at the point patients are in the high intensity unit or they are into the ICU, stage four, four stage. By the time and the thrombosis and the endothelial inflammation is progressing, patients are still in the ICU or they are at the same time either getting tracheostomy or they're having multi-organ dysfunction. If patient survives, and please, uh, most patients in the ICU do poorly, but at the same time, depending upon, uh, the kudos to our own ICU people, uh, the success rate of intubation has increased. And also over the last eight weeks, in countrywide, we have learned how to be selective in, in uh, kind of, which patients to, to intubate, to be intubated and go from there. Are you able to see, see my screen as of now? Anyway, I'll continue. I, I, I want to point out that the COVID has changed the way we have practiced medicine in the last two months or so. I would bring attention that any crisis brings change in the way the society actually acts. If you look at the 9-11 attack, after that, the society changed. We as a people changed our behavior. There was more scrutiny at the airports, et cetera, and we all kind of understood it. If you go back, SARS, first SARS infection at the, when it occurred in 2003, et cetera, at that time, that was the first time when the e-commerce was actually given a boost. And similarly, the current infection is changing the consumer behaviors, i.e. the physician behavior, as well as the behavior of the physician and the way we are practicing medicine in this country. If you look at it, the attitude, the policies, and the way we, have, we are practicing medicine is changing day by day. As was previously pointed out, the policies are being made and rewritten as we are going along. In addition, so the patients, those who survive the ICU, and they have to go back to the step yard units, but then there is a whole cohort of patients who actually do well and are discharged from the hospital and are back sent back to the community. So in those patients, in those patients, we need to be able to follow them. So not sure, at not sure, we do have a protocol to follow these patients in the outpatient setting. At the time of discharge, because the idea is one, to decrease the readmission rate, 
decrease the readmission rate. Secondly, to make sure we follow the, the end organ damage parameters, whether it is creatinine, whether it is hypoxemia, whether it is increased LFTs, that need to be followed. And also at the same time, to make sure that the vasculopathy, which is usually, which is vasculopathy, which is followed with, uh, with deem dimers, is followed down the line from the uh, at home as well. For that, it's a multi organ, multi uh, team effect in which there is a physical therapist, there is a home care person, there is a lab team, and clinician. So the clinicians follow this. As soon as the patient is discharged from the hospital in our setting, we follow those patients down the line. Uh, within a week, the patient is actually seen on a telehealth visit. All these parameters are, uh, are established. These patients will also get labs weekly or bi-weekly depending upon their results so that these are followed. The point is we have seen more than 300 of these patients after discharge successfully kept them out of the hospitals we also have something called as a COVID panel, basically, in which we measure not only the CBC, but also the D-dimers, ferritin, uh, procalcidotin, uh, and, and CRP are measured for these patients. So we want to make sure that the diffuse inflammatory response that these patients have, with, which was started in the second phase of the disease, ultimately comes to an end. Because till the time the patient has these parameters elevated, these patients are still at risk for developing some problems. So what else as a pulmonologist do we want to follow, as a critical care physician we want to follow? Uh, much has been talked about ARDS. I'm going to keep quiet about it because that has been taught. Also has been taught that probably this is one of those viruses which is causes a significant pro-thrombotic stage. In fact, I think it causes endothelitis. It is still debatable whether it is causing just pulmonary embolism or it is causing in situ thrombosis as well. The point is, maybe it is causing the hypercoagulability and arterial thrombosis, venous thrombosis, coronary artery disease in some patients, yes, but also maybe it is causing small vessel endothelial uh, uh, obstruction and, and the thrombosis as well. We also need to be cognizant of the fact that since after stage three, which is when the hyper inflammation response starts to subside, these patients are actually very uh, uh, immune suppressed. So the patient may be discharged and then come back with a superadded pneumonia, and that does happen rarely, as is in one of those patients. We also need to be aware, and both from the ventilatory strategies, as well as in those patients who have hyperinflation, that some of these patients do develop pneumomediastinum, and they also develop pneumothorax. Lastly, I also want to point that as a patient, who, uh, as a clinician who follows these patients outside, we must be cognizant of the fact that some of these patients develop reticulation. What starts as peripheral ground glass appearance, and the Chinese study has told us that at least with around 23 to 25% of these patients, once these ground glass appearances begin to go away, will be left with some kind of reticulation. So there is one big question for the pulmonary community as of now. Are these patients going to develop interstitial lung disease down the line? Only time will answer that question. The possibility at this point looks that some of these patients, even when they heal their lung, are going to be left with some kind of scarring and they'll start, will be left with a restrictive disease, a little bit of hypoxemia, and an interstitial process. Will that be progressive or not? It's not clear at this point. And what is new information, which is something that we have picked up in last one week or so, at least that's what my radiologist taught me, is development of lung cysts. Some of these patients, even this, as this is pointing out here, the CAT scans that are all put together are all of our own patients. As you can see, patient is still healing, but as now in this area, it starts to develop a lung cyst. Why are lung cysts important? By the way, the lung cysts have not been reported in the literature before. So this is for the first time we are seeing it and we have a few, seen a few cohorts of this. We'll put it in a manuscript down the line. But more importantly, I think this gives me us the idea why some of these patients are developing pneumothorax. So we need to be following our patients very closely. So the patient gets discharged, we follow them with, hopefully with a repeat CAT scan at six to eight weeks time. My own preference is eight weeks because this disease is, has a little bit longer convalescence period. 
is not a garden variety viral illness which gets better over by four to five weeks. It takes a little longer and many, many of these patients who have significant infiltrates, their infiltrates are going to take a much more longer period of time. The DVTs that we are finding as, uh, as at least in our experience here is around in intubated in, in, in the hospital 10%, though the, as high incidence of up to 30% in Italian and up to 40% in Chinese studies have been reported. So the fact that vasculopathy will continue even when the patient is discharged and even feels better, we all should be aware of. So that brings us to the point that the, we are now very clear that the, so many of these patients need to be on anticoagulation. Yes, we, we agree with that. And there are many protocols, by the way, I did put a protocol from Cleveland Clinic just to show that everybody's following D-dimers. I do want to point one, time, one thing. Before COVID started, D-dimer was the gold standard test, so-called, that you could say that if the D-dimers are high in the right clinical setting, if you could, could rule out other causes of elevated D-dimers, that maybe a patient has, maybe has some thrombotic process. But D-dimer are elevated in, in COVID patients who are, have moderate to severe infection. So that possibility that all D-dimers elevated are COVID, uh, have thrombosis, probably not correct. So we need to at least figure out who are developing these uh, and what is the cutoff level for the D-dimers for us to predict that these patients are going to develop thrombotic episodes. Thought leaders at this point have said three times the normal. So check your lab and if it's more than three times the normal, chances are your patient is in trouble. A better way to look at it right now is if the levels continue to increase in the hospital or even after discharge, if the levels start to increase, you have to think at a leg Doppler study and think about is the hypoxemia increasing work? Does this patient need to come back or, or not so that we can prevent a mortality in these patients? So D-dimer is a moving target and we have to follow it regularly uh, as the time passes. Same process has to be thought of for acute coronary syndrome that happens in these patients. And, uh, and I know cardiologists have started looking at that as well. So these patients are followed in the outpatient. We do weekly or bi-weekly bi CRP, ferritin, and D-dimers. Make sure they go away. Uh, they at least have a downward trend. We also look for hypoxemia. Each patient at the time of discharge has a visiting nurse and the visit patient is taught and provided with a pulse oximeter. I think everybody will agree. And I talked about it that uh, from, from outpatient experience, pulse oximeter, the fifth uh, physical sign at this point of time, is helping people uh, stay at home or at least preventing catastrophes. And we're also picking up patients who need to come back, the, back to the ER or, or get admitted. So those patients, think about those patients who can now get stabilized. Maybe they're left with a little bit of scarring. What are we going to do? That brings us to the practice of medicine uh, in an outpatient setting. And what is the bread and butter of pulmonology? It is pulmonary function testing. Pulmonary function testing at this time has become a, a, a major a, a difficult deal to perform, both from the infection control point of view, because we would want our PFT labs to at least have a negative pressure room. The sensors in the body box, the machine in which actually we measure the, our uh, total and capacity and, and other things, probably would need to be changed more frequently. And what about the protection for the house staff, for, for the respiratory therapist and for the patient? So the protocols have to be written. And I think each, each one of you will have to deal with it in their own setting. But the good way, the way we are pro uh, proposing it and are actually going to start is that the patient will have a COVID testing 48 to 78, two hours prior to the procedures so that at least there is no confusion, there is no con possibility of contamination, no possibility of transmission, both to the patient or to the staff. This also brings me to the point from the health economics point of view, it will be hard to do too many PFTs per day. If you, we did a trial run and we realized that now it's going to take more than an hour just to schedule a test, and then after that, the room has to be cleaned, et cetera, et cetera. So this will slow down the number of PFT procedures that we will be able to do. 
It also has, has uh, really clear that we may not be able to do too many aerosolized procedures at this point in time. So if you're not clear about the patient, we are not going to do a methylcholine challenge test. Doing cardiopulmonary exercise tests would be much more difficult. Doing six minute tests, the way it is, it's in, on, a, on a 50 meter area. You'll make sure that nobody else is around. So there are its own logistics that are going to come up with the PFT lab as we go along. And I think each one of us need to be clear about that. The second thing is bronchoscopy. And for that matter, it actually entails to all surgical procedures for the COVID patients. But I would focus on bronchoscopy. And there's a recent paper out, which is in uh, pre-publication uh, from, from CHEST, which talks about the, the specifics of bronchoscopy for in the era of COVID. So if you suspect a patient has COVID or has COVID, you obviously, needless to me, to, goes without saying, you will take all precautions at the same time. But what about when there, are, there, there, there is a procedure to be performed for another indication, and most commonly it will be for lung cancer and an area where this community spread is happening at that time, because that kind of becomes a, becomes a semi-emergency. Semi the, the bronchoscopy room is a, is a negative pressure room. All precautions will be taken. Minimum number of people need to be involved. This also brings me to the point from program director points of view, the training of bronchoscopy may be a little bit more limited uh, 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 for the coming few months, and we have to account for those things as well. I also want to point out that at this point of time, doing procedures like argon plasma coagulation, electrocautery, et cetera, which aerosolize this, the tissue, I think would have to take a back seat. So the way from bronchoscopy, bronchoelvial lavage may be possible, tissue biopsies, bleeding, et cetera. Um, maybe we have to think how we proceed onto this. Time will tell whether this infection, the surge will ultimately subside down to the point where we feel comfortable to do this on a regular basis, but given the, 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 the complexity of the logistic of performing these procedures, this is going to take a long time. So we as pulmonologists or our end critical care physicians must get used to it. That these procedures are, are going to be needed to be, need to be planned much more uh, in, in time so that they are done without any complication to the patient, to the physicians, to the, to the staff, or, or even to the transport people. I will end also with a, an important thing that Pulmonary rehabilitation, the way we have been practicing in this country is a group treatment all across. It's going to be difficult. Pulmonary rehabilitation as over the internet may be the new horizon that we have to think and reinvent it. I think the both societies, whether it is CHEST, ATS, ICCM, they, they have to come up with some kind of guidelines into it. If you look at the CMS guidelines, they talk about telemedicine. They allow you to do visits. They are silent about doing group treatment for something like physical therapy, for something like uh, pulmonary rehabilitation. So this is a, another evolving field that we have to contribute. Uh, I, I think the societies, uh, our professional societies, will have to take a little bit bigger step into it so that the pulmonary rehabilitation is followed, is offered to patients who have non-COVID conditions as well as patients who have COVID. Right now, we're trying to provide physical therapy <coughs> to patients who are recovering COVID. And I can tell you how difficult it is to get that started. Both because the patients have a, a significant sarcopenia, which is something that, that uppers, uh, occurs at the seventh, sixth or seventh week. You, your, your disease has gone away. You, your muscle mass has gone down. Most patients report around seven to 10 pound weight loss and they feel very weak, though the, the, the infection has gone away. So these patients need physiotherapy. So same way, I think we, as a group have to think how pulmonary re rehab has to be provided. There are some resources I put on the slide. I think the best one is again from the British Thoracic Society. Please look at that website as to how they, they propose to do this. I think something, a modified version of that can be, uh, can be used in any hospital. Tracheostomy has been very nicely covered by uh, Dr. Khanijo, so I'm gonna stay, keep quiet about it. I just wanna point out that patients who get tracheostomy and maybe some of these will also require a peg placement. Uh, it is possibility, folks, that may happen. They will require a placement. So bigger institutions will need to find a respiratory care unit or a unit for post-COVID, COVID, <clears throat> what we call as cement lung syndrome. Those patients who have severely advanced fibrotic lung, which is difficult now to ventilate without 
uh, and will require a con continuous uh, permanent ventilatory support. They may require uh, a peg placement as well. Uh, and this goes back to the era of uh, the Second World War. After the Second World War, many of the VA hospitals had a wing for spinal injury patients because there were so many of them. And then many people actually became trained as a spinal injury specialists, both from medicine and surgery point of view. I think we will end up with a cohort of COVID patients who have significant end organ damage, whether it is lungs or it is kidney, or maybe the many of them will have significant brain problems as well. And they would need to be monitored in kind of a special nursing homes or in a unit of a bigger institution where they are cohabited. Obviously by that time, they all become COVID negative, but they still would need to be cared so that we can provide the care of nutrition from rehab, uh, physiotherapy, uh, uh, and other cognitive uh, treatments for those patients. I will end before I, I want to point out, there was a beautiful book written in 1972 by Bernard and David White. The name of the book was The Natural History of Infectious Disease. And Dr. McFarlane nice, beautifully quotes that, and he says that the most likely forecast about the future of infectious disease, that it will be very dull. That was in 1972. Folks, this journey from 1972 to now is anything but dull. 1980 was AIDS. HIV infection, then hepatitis C infection, then in early 2000 SARS, then late 2000 MERS, and now SARS-CoV-19. SARS the infections are continuing. We all believe that we conquered the infectious disease process, and that is the end of it. It is not going to be. We need to, to, to rethink our strategies, the way we actually we teach and practice, and we may need to put more emphasis on to making sure that the next generation of physicians are more astute in terms of treating viral infections as well. Lastly, as an academic physician, I do want to point out, it is going to affect the way we deliver knowledge to the next generation of pulmonary critical care physicians. And I would like to see thoughts from Dr. Gundupali and others. Sleep medicine is going to become very difficult, both to practice, because doing inpatient sleep study is going to be a much bigger process, and teaching sleep fellows to do sleep uh, is going to be another difficult aspect of delivering that kind of education. So the way it is, it's a three-step model, the attitude, the policies, and the way the, the peripatetic physician who always modifies itself based on the circumstances, whether it is the infection or it is the onslaught from the ABIM or it's onslaught from the government, financial uh, uh, remuneration, Physicians always kind of change their behaviors, but this is the time, this is the first time where the consumer, i.e. the patient is also having to change. And we are now going to be taking, treating patients much more on telemedicine. Physical examination is going to take a backseat, not that it had already taken, but that is going to take a backseat. And all these changes are coming around the line to our practice of pulmonary medicine. Uh, I'll stop here now and I'll take any comments or uh, questions about uh, some of the thoughts that I've said. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tal Talwar. That was excellent uh, rundown about how we you know, manage these patients after discharge and all. Um, Dr. Trevino, are you, are you there? Can you, uh, can you complete your presentation before we start the question session? Dr. Travino? Uh, looks like we lost him. There we go. Okay. I, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Yeah, go on, go on. Wonderful. Great. Uh, first of all, my apologies for what happened earlier. I, um, I don't know what happened. Just got disconnected from Zoom. Um, I can uh, out. I was on my last slide on the remdesivir uh, and the treatment options. And um, just wanted to finish the talk. Uh, remdesivir is now becoming, or the closest thing that we have uh, for standard of care because it's the only thing that actually is, has been proven to have positive benefits, although mild. There was some decrease in mortality and there was some decrease in, um, in, uh, in length of duration of, 
of disease. And um, now we're moving for moving forward to uh, the next phase of that trial is we can we tie an antiviral with an immunomodulator. So tie the antiviral with tocilizumab. And I'm sorry I don't have the this the screen here the the slide here. Um, actually, I can do this. There we go. So. So the immunomodulators, tocilizumab, some positive preliminary results from China, but very small numbers. And we have the Covacta phase three trial ongoing. Um, and then we have a convalescent plasma, as you most, as all you know, is plasma donated by patients that had uh, COVID uh, and hopefully developed antibodies. And hopefully they can transmit those antibodies to whoever the plasma is being infused into and hopefully those antibodies help uh, as, uh, uh, attacking the virus. So right now there's expanded use for severe or life-threatening uh, cases. And it's not a trial, it's a more, uh, but there is collection of data to assess if it works or not. There's very small numbers that are positive, but uh, that uh, we're collecting data. And I saw in the questions of someone asking about uh, IVIG, and the truth is that there's a lot of clinical trials. There's thousands of clinical trials following COVID. And yes, there are trials with IVIGs. There are trials for antivirals. And there's trials still for antimalarials. Right now, we don't know what the role of anything uh, is, except that whenever we uh, think there's something new that we should use, it should be under a trial setting. Uh, the, uh, I didn't mention, and I just on the questions, uh, ribavirin. Uh, interferon, those were things that were being used anecdotally, don't know if there was any ben benefit or not, but no real data to, to support our management. And I'm going to stop right there so that we can move ahead with the questions. Again, my apologies for being cut off uh, earlier, and thank you for giving me the opportunity. No, no problem, Dr. Trevino. It happens to everyone. So um, I have a question uh, on the topics that you talked about, um, you know, um, there is a Jack article that came out showing anticoagulation strategies from Mount Sinai system that you talked about. And then you also showed a slide on uh, the, the dilated shot RV without, you know, in the absence of um, massive pulmonary embolism. Are we looking at a scenario wherein, you know, people who are on mechanical ventilation, th those people are benefiting from anticoagulation. So, um, should we be doing more bedside right ventricular e e echoes to monitor these patients who are going south and start them sooner on anticoagulation and, uh, you know, start thinking about ECMO strategies? Are we, is there anything else happening on that front? Yes, uh, those are great points and great questions. What, what we are trying to do is we're trying to do a bedside handheld ultrasound with like the butterfly to look at the RV every other day just to see how they are because we noticed at least on a few of the patients that we started seeing that they were arresting they would be unstable you we know we have a prolonged disease and they're stable and then suddenly they develop a tachyarrhythmia or they start being on pressors and trying to work that up is when we started realizing that RV was dilated and so the, to answer your question specifically, should we be, have a, a lower threshold to look for RV failure? The answer is yes. Uh, Baylor, us, what we started doing is we started having a low threshold for using epinephrine drip and a lower threshold for using inhaled epoprostenol or Flowland. Uh, at, a, at an attempt to give some anotropy support to the RV, to decrease the afterload of the RV, and, uh, but this is all dealing with the consequences, right? We, the, the, what is causing this RV to fail? And I think a very big component is the anticoagulation. And I think the, if the RV is already ballooned, then we might be even too late for starting anticoagulation. And so uh, going all the way from start is, should we start anticoagulation sooner? Yes, it should be much sooner than, than when we're seeing an RV failure but expect that. And so what we were teaching our fellows and sharing amongst intensivists in our system is, hey, if a patient develops a sudden onset bradycardia or a sudden onset tachyarrhythmia, think RV failure. 
to go assess, do an epi, and because this is occasionally is happening on patients that are already in anticoagulation. Yeah, so that's would, a great question. I would just add to that, if I may, uh, this is Samir speaking, um, you know, from a health system where we use ultrasound for everything uh, more than we use CAT scans and x-rays, I, I do think in, in terms of critical care, the bedside ultrasound becomes a hallmark of what we do. It, you know, it takes us about five to seven minutes to do a whole body ultrasound. So if you scale that down just to look at the heart and the lungs, you can do that in the two minutes that you're in the room and really get an idea of what the RV to LV ratio looks like. Uh, and that way you're not behind the ball for when you see these tachyarrhythmias or bradycardias, that you have an idea of what the, the RV is doing over a couple of days. And, and again, you know, something that we do as part of critical care on a day-to-day -day basis, we can really move forward to help these patients because it's easier for us to get our bedside ultrasound. It's easier for me to do the ultrasound than to get a formal echo, to get an x-ray tech to come up, to do a lot of these other things. And then we can help guide our clinical care management. So I, I really do think um, the ultrasound is, is beneficial and helpful. And, and again, also in the long-term aspect, as you move outwards, if these patients develop pulmonary hypertension long-term, you have an idea of what you're seeing and how you're seeing it. Uh, I agree as well um, with the increased use of bedside uh, ultrasound. Uh, with the, that's why I think a number of our ICUs have brought, uh, bought small units, handheld units. Um, the um, uh, other uh, issue is uh, we have been doing a lot of prone um, echoes of the heart and the images seem to be very good. One of our fellows just published. It. Yes, absolutely. So it's like a sixth vital sign, maybe for COVID patients. <laughs> the, All right, next, the next question, you yeah. want me to go with next question? Yeah, okay. right. yeah. Uh, would be interesting to know if the incidence of DVDs and PEs nationwide was higher than, bas than baseline in November, December, January, and perhaps not captured as COVID in those early days, undercounting the COVID cases and deaths. Any experience or any studies on that? Uh, this is this is a this, I don't know. this is a retrospective way of looking at it. The number of PEs and DVDs done countrywide are, are numerous. Uh, the incidence of COVID patients who are actually being diagnosed with PE, if you, if you look at the numbers, is not that large. So it will be hard to extrapolate the data. Secondly, we are talking of a very specific group. These are COVID positive patients. So Hard to say that those patients in, in November, December had only DVTs, did not have other symptoms. Keep in mind, majority of patients who had DVT also had respiratory failure, some cardiac issues. They had severe hypoxemia. Standalone DVT is not occurring that commonly. What is occurring is even after discharge, once you have been very sick in the hospital and you're perceived now stable, you're either on room air or on a very low oxygen, you go home and you still end up developing DVT. So that is a totally different kind of patient population. So not sure that based on the DVT, we will be able to say that there was COVID in uh, October and November in, in the country at, at that point. Hard to make that, that connection. There was another question on the chat group that how long would you continue the anticoagulation? Yes, I, I, uh, again, if you look at the, the Society of Thrombosis recommendation, it is 40 days. We as such, we as a group uh, in our hospital, after the discharge for another 30 days, we are continuing that. Because the, the remodeling by that time, if it has to occur, would have occurred by that time. Now there is a scientific way of looking at it and that's, uh, we are still thinking whether it should be. If your patient has D-dimers elevated, you can follow it. As the D-dimers come back to normal, then you can think of stopping it. And I can tell you from experience, some people are, are not coming down right away. Some people are taking longer time. Others are perfectly back to normal within a week or two after discharge. And some are even normal by the time they're discharged from the hospital. So maybe following D-dimers may be a better way. It needs to be proven and scientifically studied. But at this point of time, at least four to six weeks, they should be anticoagulated post-discharge at that point, the promise is that patient is ambulating, is able mobile, he's not sitting down and, and lying down. So at the same time, you think of the risk back again. What are the predisposing factors? Is this patient at risk? Is he going to be bed bound? Is he, not, is he elderly? 
is he any other limitation does he have any other comorbidity which is going to cause him to become hypercoagulable in that case the the anticoagulation will continue so the message should be for people who are going to follow covid patients down the line that i think if there's no contraindication they should be on anticoagulation till the time patient is completely stable and mobile so that their risk of any thrombotic episode is very low okay uh, i have question to the uh, speakers uh, is the physician from new york and she infected with the covid she took them hydroxychloroquine for four days got well covid negative but she complains of shortness of breath now okay chest x is negative she's asking you know whether you can take any trial of steroid um, does anybody want to else take it or do you want me to answer this question i um, think you can we can answer it uh, let me talk about the chest pain a chest pain syndrome in covid uh, i know it because i had covid okay uh, so the chest pain in covid patients even when they recover it doesn't go down doesn't go away in 2 to 3 weeks that the dullness of the chest pain is in, around the sternum it is more when you lie down it feels like a little bit of pericarditis that when you sit up and move forward it gets better this pain is more where, uh, when you try to do some activity first time you move up and all that but it just takes at least 4 to 6 weeks for this kind of for this pain to go away the point is the cough syndrome in post covid patients who had moderate to severe disease also is lasting in some patients at least 6 weeks general viral illness cough goes away by 3 to 4 week in these patients the cough is going away so i think this this virus likes to cause significant changes in the lung parenchyma as well as the airways that the injury re repair mechanism is delayed and how do we know that because some of these patients are developing fibrotic interreticulations and i also showed you the cat scan that patients who are very severe infiltrates some of them ended up developing lung cysts which is an abnormal reparative mechanism of the lung so the chest pain that these patients have even after the viremia goes away which takes only one week some of these patients are going to have these symptoms for a while now question back to the steroids and i have no data to prove it but i agree with the european guidelines that once the the hyper inf inf inflammatory state has started maybe at that time steroids can be used we are using steroids in post op in in in, in outpatient for those patients who are in fourth and fifth week and are still having similar symptoms feeling of shortness of breath tiredness fatigue and dry cough but just we want to make sure that they are not you know, by the time they're all covid negative and many of them have developed antibodies also so at that the dose that we're using is much more low i have to again one say for full disclosure that this is just based on experience this is not uh, there is no study to, to say that but covid causes significant inflammation there is that is not in doubt so i i, I believe late stages of the stake uh, of the disease process there is no harm using low dose steroids Oh, thank you. I think this lady uh, is of, uh, uh, Dr. Sergio. Is negative in this lady, right? Is that correct? Uh, sorry. I mean, uh, COVID yes, ma'am. This yes. lady, COVID was negative, and now she is yes. short of breath. Correct. Uh, I mean, you know, if it's a nasopharyngeal, you know, the yield may be sixty or seventy percent. So yes. either she had COVID, or if she's still short of breath, they need to work up. you know what's going on maybe repeat a ct or chest x ray or something before you give steroids the chest x ray normal is it she needs to see a pulmonologist how's that <laughs> so okay. one, one more uh, last uh, question uh, dr uh, sarjo uh, uh, the question on uh, uh, comment on using outpatient steroids in covid patients can you initiate the steroid meds uh, before you go if you have problem you know um this is uh the this, the question is for can or should we use outpatient steroids on covid diagnosis um this is pre pre hospital in mild cases correct is that the question yeah uh, the, the 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 short answer is we don't know uh, um there's ad, the, there are people that advocate for it there are uh, groups that advocate against it just today we had a very large um uh, meeting about and discussing this amongst 12 intensivists from all different specialists and id physicians 
that should we have a lower threshold because we're using it for the inflammatory phase and we're having some uh, reaction response or good response to it. And just Dr. Tower said, uh, there's a role for them and little downside, but it's too early. Uh, is, is there a point where it gets too early? And uh, the answer is we don't know. Um, we can only extrapolate from other viral infections. And we know that treating influenza with uh, steroids early will make it worse. And we all have all those patients that uh, they get a, a, a steroids from an urgent care clinic and uh, a mild case becomes an intubated case. And so uh, the short answer is, I don't know, sir. I don't have the answer, but I don't think anyone else has it either. Moderate hydronephrosis. When, when do you use plasma in your practice, you know, in your patients? I'm sorry? When do you use plasma in your patient practice? Great, great question. Um, in the ICU, uh, most of the patients, we, uh, we screened, we, we were screening for different trials. The remdesivir trial, the tocilizumab trial, and the plasma. Basically, we use the pla convalescent plasma for, uh, as a last resource. Uh, when the patients are very sick in the ICU, when they're not candidates for any other therapy, and sometimes even when they're candidates for other therapy, but they're sick enough, we still give convalescent plasma. Now, you would think as an, uh, as an intensivist or as a physiologist, you would think uh, if someone's in the ICU and they have this hyperinflammatory response, and now you're going to give them foreign plasma. And you can debate that by the time they're this sick, the virus is no longer playing a major role, is the, is the inflammation. And so if we give foreign someone else's plasma, to someone's body that's already angry, and uh, would there be any benefit or not? And the answer is we don't know yet. Uh, the report says that there's some uh, benefit, even when it's this sick. And so we're not using it early in the disease. When we use it early in the disease is when there's a transplant patient that's not a candidate for any other therapy. And so then we use convalescent plasma early in the disease. Other than that, when they're sicker in the in the ICU. If I may jump in at Northwell on uh, in New York, we've actually been doing it a little bit different. We've had, um, you know, experience where, again, in this hyperinflammatory state, once these patients are in the ICU, um, they seem not to do quite as well with the, the convalescent plasma. And so we've been trying to push for it to be given earlier in the hopes that there's something that will help subdue the viral replication. Again, we run into a little bit of problems in the patients early on who are being, uh, you know, evaluated for either tocilizumab or in our institution, they'd been looking at anakinra, which is an IL-1 inhibitor. Right. So giving uh, an immuno, the medicine that's going to cause immunodeficiency and then giving plasma as well, that seems a little contradictory. But, you know, we, we found, again, I, I think by the time they get to the ICU and especially early on in this disease process, when they were getting so hyper-inflammatory, you know, we, we've seen uh, CRPs reaching uh, based on our uh, our units, 300, 400, um, and, and numbers that we've never seen before. Uh, and, and at that time, it seems that using the convalescent plasma has not been as successful uh, in our patient population. Um, you know, we've seen, again, anecdotally, there's a lot of things everyone can say, I see this, I see that. But we've seen some microangiopathic processes, hemolysis related to this. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of volume overload, which again, may be less important in people that are already intubated. Um, but our, our thoughts has been that um, maybe trying to get some of these things earlier on, because the truth is once someone is intubated and in the ICU, their mortality gets much worse. Um, and so really trying to do all the things that we can to prevent them from getting to us has been where we found the most success. And that, you know, is coming from an institution where initially um, our health system did not want us to use high flow on the floors because again of concern for viral sheddings. They didn't want us to do a lot of these things. And so um, probably for, you know, for lack of a better term, people were getting intubated early, even if they were on, you know, 15 liters of nasal cannula plus a non rebreather plus prone on the floors and, and they were failing uh, and they were getting intubated and not doing quite as well. And so I think we've moved now to a, a, a situation where we're able to give more supplemental oxygen without intubation, but also getting some of these things. You know, remdesivir has always been a little bit difficult for us because the trial specifications were, were very difficult. And again, most patients that were in the ICU had some element of renal failure, which would automatically disqualify them, uh, at least in the trials that we had access to. But again, 
I think our experience has been that earlier treatment has been better um, and kept people away from me, which is which is probably a good thing. Yeah, thank I, you. I agree with all the above. Yeah. Uh, uh, the role of plasma pheresis, anybody tried locally? One of the couple of anecdotes that uh, the thought process is that for cytokine storm, when you do the plasma pheresis and exchange within a couple of uh, treatments, they were able to get significant improvements and they were able to extubate these patients. Um, any uh, any of the other centers have tried any locally? We haven't used plasma phoresis. We've used uh, uh, different commercially available products called Cytosorb, um, which is a, a sort of a similar machine that can be attached either to an ECMO circuit or a dialysis circuit that theoretically filters out cytokines. Um, you know, again, we've had, I think, three or four patients that have gone on it. So I, I can't really tell you our results. They're mixed, but, you know, we haven't gone down the lines of using plasma phoresis itself yet. Um, you know, in discussion with our blood bank uh, and our, our hematologist, there was thought that maybe this wasn't the, the best therapy to use. Um, but we've tried some of these other things. I, I know, uh, I believe it was Japan had some literature that came out that they were using um, uh, filters to, to filter out cytokines as well. And they had success, but our, our data is probably 50-50. See, the cytokine storm would, uh, the plasma phoresis will be helpful. Uh, am, I, am I audible? Yeah. Plasma yeah. phoresis will be, will be helpful if we knew there was a specific antibody that was causing this. In this disease, we really do not know what is causing this. Is the viral particle itself or an antibody to the viral itself or the body trying to control the, the viral? So we, there, there are so many unanswered questions. So we cannot use the plasma phrases that effectively. The cytosorb, the treatment, which can be combined with ECMO and other things, makes sense in which you can just remove the, the, uh, the, uh, the, part, the cytokines which are causing the hyperimmune reaction. Even that has had not that much significant results. And coming to the point by the time patient is intubated, end organ damage has already set in. So trying to remove the, this antibody at that point may not be that effective. So those strategies have to be earlier on. That is why convalescent plasma who's using much earlier in the, in the treatment makes sense. But then there are other, other logistics to it. Should we use tocilizumab first or should we use plasma? Can the two be combined? It's not, it's not clear whether there's, one is an IL-6 blocker, the other one, we, we are giving patients uh, anti antibodies. So we don't know. So these are the things that we are going to get answered as time goes along in, in, in this disease process. I mean, okay, this so is one disease, I think, uh, where um, nobody knows the answer. I got an email from, I think, um, I have seen the WhatsApp medicine practice the most in this disease. The WhatsApp <laughs> group saying, I've used uh, ivermectin. I mean, what kind of a virus is this? We're giving anti malarial so we're giving anti-parasite, and we're doing this, we're doing that, and we have anecdotal, uh, you know, responses. Um, and I think the FDA and the national agencies and some of the papers you see in JAMA, you would never see it uh, in the past. So yeah. these are observational right. studies. While I respect them, I think we have to be a little bit careful because everybody is doing everything. I know this WhatsApp group we have, it's amazing what people are using. It's the end of one and people say that they're getting better. So I think it's a little, we have to be a little skeptical. Yes, uh, so, Dr. Gutupali, but I do want to point out from uh, one from personal experience, this is not end of one. It is end of around 40 patients that I'm treating. Out by, most of them have been discharged from the hospitals. Deep breathing exercises work. I'm not saying it is making them 100% better. I'm not claiming anything to it, but slow deep breathing exercises, diaphragmatic exercises, avlom, vilom, pranayam works. I did it every day, and I can tell you it helps. Whether, I'm, whether it is a psychological booster, but I do believe a lot of COVID patients do get sarcopenia. And on an average, these people are losing seven to 10 pounds by the time they come out of the hospital. And one of the things that become thin are their muscles. So does the inspiratory muscle, so does the diaphragm. And we need to train them. And I think if you have a patient who's recovering from COVID, deep breathing exercises will keep them outside the hospital. It does not cost anything. It has, I don't have a trial to prove this. I'm just my own way of thinking about it. And I can tell you many of my patients oh. are doing it and they have felt benefit with it. Whether it is just- I couldn't agree with you more. 
I have no problem with that. So basically, basically, you are capturing the dead space, right, by doing the deep breathing exercises. That's right. Yes. So also training excellent. the respiratory muscles. Okay. Next excellent. question is on IV IG used in ICU patients. Any experience with that? Any benefit? We've used it a lot in our patients with myocarditis, um, and it seems to work. I, I know there are case reports uh, in some of the cardiology journals initially, um, but we haven't just been using it uh, otherwise. But uh, in the case of uh, myocarditis, we've, we've seen it with, uh, with good effect. We haven't uh, used a lot of IVIG at, at uh, Baylor in Houston. And there are more than a handful of trials ongoing or about to start recruiting, but we haven't uh, used it. We have no experience with it. Thank you. Another question from the audience was uh, between New York and Baylor. This question is about purely your experience, not about the scientific studies uh, that are published yet. Between, between New York and uh, Baylor, your experience, tocilizumab versus remdesivir. Which group has responded better in ICU patients? So, um, I'll eventually defer to Dr. Trevino, but I, I will say in our ICU patients, most of them don't qualify for remdesivir. Um, so unless they've gotten it on the floors before they've gotten to us, you know, the, the renal failure and the LFTs upper greater than five times the upper limit of normal have disqualified most patients for us. So we do have a lot of patients that have received tocilizumab. You know, initially in our experience, we weren't giving tocilizumab. Uh, we were, you know, sort of predisposed to anakinra or um, just supportive care. And um, we found that tocilizumab patients that got it early seemed to do well. The one caveat to that is we've seen that patients who have gotten tocilizumab that seems to be in the peri-intubation state, um, one, have not done as well, but two, uh, we've probably seen about 10 to 12 uh, bowel perforations. So pneumatosis intestinalis, uh, you know, bowel ischemia, bowel perforations, uh, and quite severe abdominal catastrophes where, um, you know, as the, it's been given as a last ditch to try and prevent people from getting intubated who are going to get intubated anyway in that setting. Um, while it makes the CRPs look better, um, we've seen complications with regards to um, uh, surgical abdomens, um, which we're not seeing in patients that get it very early in their stay. We are still uh, recruiting quetocilizumab. I think we are close to probably, I think, eighth one from our place. I think, uh, Sergio, you had more than 30 or something. Uh, right. Fortunately, we have not seen the bowel perforation or mesenteric ischemia. Good. Uh, now, what do you guys think about uh, monoclonal antibody against uh, ACE, inhibit ACE2 receptor? I heard uh, there are some uh, studies going on or coming up with a molecule for that. Not something that I have any experience with, so hard for me to, to comment there's a, on. There's a beautiful review uh, two weeks ago in NEGM on ACE receptors and their heterogeneity. <laughs> ACE, ACE2 receptors are there for a purpose, and they have some some protective function as well. So not sure just having an, a monoclonal antibody against ACE2 will be the final answer to it. This virus not only binds to ACE2, it also has a spike protein, also has a protein called as furin. So that can still uh, get, get the damage done through another different pathway. So not sure by uh, having, the, the virus has to be attacked in one way or the other not the receptor in the body, which is ACE2, which has a function of its own, needs to be attacked. That's the way I think of it. Pali, Dr. Guntupalli and others, uh, thank you very much. But I want uh, everyone of us, you comment on the initial angst we had about the PPE, masks, and general perception of how the things are going on. Is the epidemic um, coming down in your respective place? the numbers are looking like and what the confidence level of treating these patients is. So I'll start, I guess, uh, from New York, where we've, we've been doing this for quite some time, unfortunately. Uh, PPE has been a concern um, for me a little bit less so than uh, some of my colleagues. But, um, you know, I think as a physician, it's been a little bit easier for me to get uh, equipment and supplies if I stomp my feet a little bit. But for nurses, respiratory therapists, residents, fellows, PPE has been a, a big concern. Um, you know, it's less now. We have a, a good policy in place and our health system has done well. But, you know, my wife works at a different institution where they weren't getting N95 masks and it, it was a little difficult. 
Um, our number of patients in the ICU is clearly down. I think at max, we were at uh, about 190 patients. Patients in, in each of our tertiary care centers that were intubated in. and so numbers that were far overwhelming were down um, to about a hundred maybe a little bit less now so the numbers are decreasing but again as New York we haven't yet officially opened so I expect a little bit of a surge as that goes on you know I, I think that those two things are, are worrisome but also the concern about bringing this disease home bringing it home to uh, my wife my child um, you know some of those social things are a little bit um, uh, troubling and we've you know it's become our new norm and our new way of life uh, I'm fortunate again to work in a health system with mentors like Dr. Talwar uh, and and, um, and and colleagues who make it easier to go to work so I think really that camaraderie has been very important for us uh, and the whatsapp groups and the zoom meetings and, and you know sort of maintaining some connection uh, I also as one of the pictures had shown earlier um, had some breakdown on my nose from wearing n95 masks all day uh, again, that's starting to heal a little bit, but you know, I, I think a lot of these issues are are real and and very concerning. And I remember in the first uh, two three weeks of this, I, I had to talk to my respiratory therapist every day and ask how many ventilators do we have left. The question I never thought I would have to ask. Uh, and one day the answer was we have one ventilator left in our hospital. And so, you know, fortunately we didn't run out, but those were serious concerns. I mean, I think we were fortunate in in uh, Houston because we learned from um, you know what was going on in the rest of the uh, country so the um, city was closed down you know the schools were closed down fairly early on um, so i think at, at the peak of um, the number of cases the tertiary case hospitals in the texas medical center was like 65 and the other hospital was like maybe uh, 50 cases so I don't think we ever ran out of the ventilators. We have a website called tmc.org um, uh, TMC where we, every single day we know how many PPEs are in the medical center, how many beds we have, how many ventilators we have, and there are thresholds that they publish. Are we in the red zone, green zone, or orange zone? So we have been, we, have, we are out of the red zone and we have pretty good supply of PPEs and ventilators and bed capacity and so on. At least what I'm seeing is the number of cases has come down, but now I think we are almost at steady state that if we send two, three patients out, we're getting two, three patients in. Sergio, yeah. anything you want to say? We are no, I, a lot of, lot of questions still coming up from the participants uh, and we are running out of time, but we have a few questions left uh, from, the, from the audience. On the topic of PPE, uh, one pulmonologist wants to ask, you know, he has seven PP, uh, N95 masks and he rotates them one at a time because their hospital ran out of them. Uh, he just keeps it there and then the seventh day he picks up the first one. So any thoughts on that? This, this technique is tried in India. Uh, this technique is already being used in all Indian Institute of Medical Sciences. This allows right. you to, so right. what happens, you, you use your PPE one day and then you let it dry out. You use the second one and you, that way, you, the, the life of the, the N95 mask uh, in a resource poor country is actually prolonged. And that's exactly what, what this person has asked. Uh, but I think even there, after, after the 14th day, they're asking you to actually throw it away and then go back and use it. The N95 mask, its ability to block these small particles will slowly wither away as you use it. So it's not going to be 100% over a long period of time. I mean, they, we are recycling them. Uh, you can send them uh, and yes. then, you, know, you can get them back. Y yes, you can. We use one per day. Yes, one per day. That's exactly what he's doing. He's using one per day, a new different mask, and goes back to the eighth day, the previous mask. But you can recycle them too. Absolutely. Right. And what is the dose of steroids if, if you are using in ICU patients? So we've been using uh, 0.5 mg per kilogram um, twice per day. Uh, so on total, one milligram per kilogram over the whole day. Um, you know, we've had some success. And again, I, as full disclosure, I've trained under Dr. Talwar, who uh, loves steroids. And so, you know, we find that it helps with some of the hyperinflammatory states. We do get a little bit of pushback from our infectious disease colleagues. You know, they get overly concerned or very concerned about infections and, and sort of the, the secondary bacteremias. But the truth is if we can't get these patients to breathe and we can't get them to overcome their uh, respiratory failure, then 
they're going to die anyway, then sometimes steroids is not a bad idea. So, you know, we've been using it more often than not, but we continue to have these discussions as a group about whether, uh, whether we should or we shouldn't. At, uh, at Baylor's and Luke's, we also, when we use steroids, we are actually following the, the protocol described in, uh, in, uh, in that paper that I presented in the, in, in, uh, in my slides. And it's basically a one milligram per kilogram bolus followed by one milligram per kilogram a day, um, for two weeks or until extubation. And, uh, and then, yeah, methylprednisolone, thank you, Dr. G. And then uh, going to half, I mean, 0.5 milligrams per kilogram uh, a day for another two weeks and then tapering down. And so um, that's basically what we start doing, but like you guys, and we're still debating every day, should we do it earlier? Should we do it when, when should we start on more patients for the same reasons? So Dr. Trevino is an infectious disease critical care, by the way. Yes. Very impressive. One more pending from the audience. Uh, anybody using inhaled nitric oxide? And also extend on that mesenchymal stem cell and zelf. Mesenchymal stem cell. And uh, that TNF alpha, uh, TNF. Thanks, Zelda. What was the first question? Uh, anybody using uh, inhaled nitric oxide? Or uh, you know, RV failure or RV dysfunction, acute pulmonary hypertension. I mean, uh, let me tell yeah. you, my, my yeah, go for it. Yeah, the presence of RV dilatation it tells you it's a terminal event. RV dilatation in any disease, even if it's liver disease, renal disease, uh, sepsis. Once the RV dilatation occurs, it generally is a terminal phenomenon. Uh, just using a non-specific vasodilator, which is short-acting nitric oxide, I don't know is the final answer to this problem, because if unless and until you treat the underlying cause for this, whether it is in situ thrombosis or thrombogenicity or anything else which is leading to the RVLV dysfunction, I don't think just giving nitric oxide is going to change anything. It's a very expensive treatment. I don't think even using Flolan in these patients without evidence of a clot, just giving just because the RV is a little dilated, would end up be, being the final answer. We have to treat the underlying condition for which we don't have the treatment as of yet. So just nitric oxide, even, I, I hope everybody knows, 15 years ago, nitric oxide was tried in ARDS as well, because you do get RV dysfunction as that. It didn't change any of the outcomes. So I don't think it is going to change the outcome in COVID-related ARDS kind of. Uh, okay. uh, a question is, uh, how about inhaled, inhaled uh, prostacyclines? Prostacycline. Inhaled prostacyclines is the same thing. It is the same thing. Uh, it's just a different mechanism of causing pulmonary artery vasodilatation. Trying to do pulmonary artery vasodilatation uh, without treating the underlying thing may only actually may make the ventilation perfusion mismatch worse. It will dilate even those areas which where, where there is significant uh, alveolitis, so you will have more uh, ventilation perfusion mismatch. It is not going to work. Now we hear about the MELD score and all. Um, is there any scoring uh, parameters that are being used to predict uh, morbidity and mortality in the patients actually, present initially? Yeah, this, this paper came out today. Actually, it's in, in one of the JAMA internal medicine predictors of uh, predictors for a patient going into the ICU. This is a Chinese study. Again, you have to take a grain of salt. It's a multiple logistic regression. I have saved this slide somewhere, but I'm not unable to pull it up right now. It looks at the age and even lympho lymphopenia, LFTs, and a bunch of hypoxemia and a bunch of other score parameters to say that if these higher scores on this, uh, it is going to be a high chance that your patient is going to go to the ICU. The thing, good thing about the study was they first actually studied it in some 700 patients, and then they, they, they used it prospectively in another uh, cohort and showed that it was predictive of patients going to the ICU. That's the only th thing that I'm aware of for the COVID patients. The only thing I would say about inhaled flow line um, is uh, it's just in the severe hypoxic respiratory failure algorithm after you paralyze the patient and prone the patient, you may want to consider using it. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. 
Yeah. Any more questions, moderators? So one last one was about the perinatal transmission. Um, any update on this? Perinatal transmission. Anybody want to? Okay. Hard, to, hard, hard to say on this at this point of time. Uh, the thing is, it's such a moving thing. Previously, we thought it's not going to affect. There's a very little chance pregnant people are getting it. Now we know that pregnant women are also getting it. Previously, we thought children will not get it. And now we know there is a ch in children post COVID, there is a post viral Kawasaki like disease. So I'm not aware of any perinatal transmission. But again, guys, uh, we have to be very cautious uh, of this disease. We really don't understand the full spectrum of the damage uh, the way it, this virus is causing. We have seen several pregnant and uh, postpartum patients as well. I'm sure you've seen more in New York. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That initially it was thought that the pregnant patients are like flu has a predilection, predilection from pregnant women that COVID is not like that. And probably no, we have seen an, enough number of pregnant people and I'm following uh, two of them in the outpatient as well after the treatment. Excellent. Thank you all. And I want to see Vijay, can you unmute Dr. Suresh Reddy? I think what we could do is the questions that are not answered, if you can send it to us, we will try to answer and you can publish it later on. Sure. You know, Dr. Thank, thank you, how, how about having another one at a little, late, little later date? You know, because these questions keep, keep popping up and uh, it seems like, you know, we are going on and on. So we'll, we'll do a different one. Uh, absolutely. We're going to do it. Definitely. You know, it's very, very interactive and everybody appreciate uh, the speakers today and, um, and the moderators too. You know, we had an excellent group and we'll do another one, uh, part B later. And let's see Dr. Suresh Reddy wrap up the today's webinar, please. Thank you. Yeah. Can, you hear, can you all hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sudhakar, for putting this together. It's a wonderful show. And uh, thank you all the speakers, uh, uh, my mentors, uh, Dr. Kalpalata Guntupeli, uh, and uh, other good speakers, Seema Tekwani, Samir Kanijo, and uh, Sergio Trevino, and uh, uh, Arnab Thalwa, uh, and uh, moderators, uh, Prasad, Dr. Prasad Garmella, Dr. Sunil Kaza, and Dr. Sunil Sujit Punam, and Dr. Sudhakar Jonalagada. Everybody did a wonderful job. Uh, thank you very much uh, for participating in these happy events. Uh, 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 we would uh, like you to join again. Uh, uh, we'll try to do, uh, we are doing a CME COVID seminar uh, summit on June 26 to 28. So we'll bring all the speakers together and we'll do a, like a mega summit. Uh, we would like you to join us at the time. Uh, we'll let you know more information. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.